In this episode, I'm going to talk about this guy, which is the Carver C9 Sonic Hologram Generator. Now, in 1983, you could have bought one of these guys for $299 or about $950 in 2024 money. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is a product of the audio genius, Bob Carver. He's had several uh, companies with his name or without his name. And one of the things he has given to the audio world is the sonic holography. Now, other companies kind of did similar things, but Bob Carver, I think, put sonic holography on the map. He used it in a lot of preamps. The C1 has it. Several of the preamp tuners have it. I actually have two preamp tuners, the CTC6 and the CTC7, that have sonic hologram generators in them. Now, for those who didn't have a Carver preamp and wanted to get the sonic holography effect, you could have purchased the C9. And as I recently changed out my main systems preamp from a CT7 to the Macintosh C48, I also gave up my sonic holography and I decided that I really wanted to have sonic holography as an option in my listening. And I purchased the C9. This particular one I got off of eBay, probably about 135 bucks with shipping and tax and everything. And it did work. So if you do buy one, try to make sure you have a guarantee that it works. And we're gonna go into some of the data. I was always curious what uh, this guy does to the audio signal that goes through it. And we'll see that and also, I can just tell you a little bit about the listening experience that I have with it. I really like that. There are three basic controls on the C9. One of them allows you to disengage the sonic holography so you can basically just bypass the whole C9. You also have an injection ratio, which is normal or theoretical. And then you have another push button that selects between narrow aperture or wide aperture. Now as far as the nitty gritties of those, the owner's manual goes into a lot more detail as to what those effects do and you can just kind of play around with them. The only bad thing about the C9 is it does not have a remote control which the preamps like the preamp tuners like the CT7 or the CT6, you can switch the hologram generator on or off so it makes it a lot easier to hear the effect when you're listening to the music. Uh, this one you'd have to get up and push the button in and go back to your seat and see if you hear a difference. But uh, they, it does make an effect and I really do like it. It doesn't work with all music and once you look at the data in a little bit, you'll kind of just wonder some things, but we'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, I thought we would just look at the back of the unit. It's pretty straightforward. So the back of the unit has your in and out RCA jacks, and then you do have a unswitched AC outlet. And basically, it's not very heavy, and it's kind of just a, a simple device. It's not very wide. Uh, I'm not sure about the length, maybe about 17 inches and probably two inches thick. So it's kind of a small item altogether. And it's just kind of one of those things that um, I, I just like listening to uh, a lot of music with that sonic holography. Of course, there's a lot of setup. You want to have your speakers set right and you want to be in the right position in the room. And uh, if you have all that done, you can get a real nice effect. And even if you don't have everything set up perfectly with certain music, the effect is very dramatic. And I pointed that out in some of the other videos that I've done with the uh, Carver uh, preamp tuners that I have, or even the C1 about that sonic holographic effect. So anyway, right now we're going to just pop the cover and see what it looks like uh, looking down from the top. And then We'll go into the test data and then I will have a final comment. Here's a close-up view of the Carver C9. The power LED is on. There is no on-off switch for the unit. Once it's plugged in, it's powered on. Starting on the right, you can see that we have our sonic holography function button here. So when it is pressed in, it's engaged. 
Then we have a couple settings for the listening aperture, this guy right here, which are narrow and wide. And then we have the injection ratio, which is normal or theoretical. This is what the inside of the C9 looks like. Here is our standard THD SNR plot at 1 kilohertz with a 2 volt RMS signal going in and basically coming out of the C9. The C9 is in the bypass mode, so none of its circuitry is affecting anything. It kind of just shows you the effect of having the C9 in the loop. It really doesn't add anything to the THD, and the SNRs are uh, really good at above 100 dB. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn on the C9. I also should point out that the injection ratio switch is set for normal, and the listening aperture is set for narrow. You can also see that we've got a little over 2 dB of loss depending on the channel. Our distortion is still really, really low at less than 0.002%. SNRs are above 86 dB. Now, there is a specification for THD. It should be better than 0.05% from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a 2 volt RMS signal going in. So it is performing much better than that. Right now, I'm going to set the injection ratio to theoretical. And you can see that it didn't really change anything greatly as far as the THD. The loss uh, through it changed by about a dB. And the SNRs, uh, I don't think they really changed that much. So I'm going to go ahead and back him out. I'm going to set the listening aperture now to wide. So with the listening aperture set to wide, we're a little bit higher on the loss than it was uh, when it's in the normal position. And you can see that the THD is still really low. We're at 0.002%, we'll call it. However, the SNR did improve when we went to the wide mode. It's almost at, uh, we'll call it 89 dB. There is a, another specification for the C9 that says that the output at clipping should be more than 6 volts RMS at 1 kilohertz. Well, right now I've got 6.2 volts RMS going in. We're still at, oh, 2.5 dB of loss. Our distortion is still better than, we'll call it 0 0.00. And ours are pretty good. They're above 96 dB, we'll just say. So it's meeting that requirement. I'm not going to crank it anymore because we've already hit 6 volts and it's looking really good. And I should point out that I do have the mode on narrow and we are on the injection ratio of normal. Here is the C9's frequency response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a 2 volt RMS signal applied across that band. Now the hologram is switched on, of course. The listening aperture is set for narrow, and the injection ratio is set for normal. And if you look at the service manual, it does have a, a frequency response curve for one channel being driven or both channels being driven. And if you come over and compare this with the one for both channels being driven, let me just kind of bring that in over here. So this is right here what you would expect for both channels being driven and it does follow what we have right now very closely it gives actual db values but we are pretty much uh, within those specifications now it also has a specification or a plot for just one channel being driven and let me go ahead and i'll turn off the right tone so i've turned off the right tone and if i compare just the one channel being driven plot with what we have right here versus what we have in the service uh, manual. Let me bring that in once again. And so this guy right here would be for one channel. This dotted line is for one channel being driven. And it actually gives values. And you can kind of just eyeball it and see that 20 hertz were down 10 dB, which is what the graph shows. And we have uh, a little dip right here and that matches up with the frequency and the level and at the high end of the band we're at oh maybe almost two tenths of a db which is about what that graph shows so it looks like this particular c9 has stayed within the calibration after all these years so let's see what happens to the frequency response if we 
switch it from normal injection ratio to theoretical. It kept the same basic shape, but it added a little bit more attenuation. And we kind of saw that there was more attenuation at just the one kilohertz THD SNR measurement. So I'm gonna go back to the normal injection ratio. Okay, and what I'm gonna do now is switch the listening aperture from narrow to wide. So you can kind of see how it changed the frequency response, mainly more at the high end, it, it tweaked some things there. Here is the C9's IMD response, and it does have a specification that it should be better than 0.05%. And I've got both a 19 and 20 kilohertz signal applied at about two volts RMS each. And that would be these guys here. And then you have some sum and differences between those. And then you have some over here. If I put my IMD calculator to work, I calculate that the left and right channels are really, really small as far as the IMD uh, percentage. They're 0.00003%, whatever that is. It's pretty darn small. And it would be meeting the specification. Right now we're looking at the system noise of the C9 with both of the inputs terminated into shorts. There is a specification that with a weighting applied, it should be 30 microvolts or better. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the A weighting. Give it a moment here. And we're at about oh, 43 to 46 microvolts, worst case. And you can see it's from this 60 Hertz uh, power supply leakage here. But for something that is as old as this, it's not too far off of that noise specification. This plot shows the C9's THD versus frequency for several different input power levels. The 12 dVB input right here would be about four volts RMS going into the unit and the minus 12 dBV would be about 250 millivolts. And for the most part, we are better than about point, oh, we'll say 0.607% THD. We do have one little anomaly here. Uh, it might be more of a measurement error than anything, but uh, it got up to 1% at minus 10 dBV input for just the left channel. So I think it's more of an, a measurement anomaly than anything. But for the most part, it's almost meeting the specification of less than 0.05% THD across the band. And that would be with a listening aperture of narrow and an injection ratio of normal. Here is the C9's crosstalk from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a zero dBV signal going into it. And you have to keep in mind that the way that the sonic holography works is it takes some of the right channel inverts it 180 degrees out of phase and sends it over to the left channel and it does the same thing with the left channel and so so you're always going to see some of the right channel into the left channel and vice versa but this is kind of just what it shows at best case you're seeing a, a crosstalk of oh 5 db and then you can see down in this range that there actually is a negative uh, crosstalk Right now I have the outputs of the C9 going into 47k ohm loads and I do have my two scope probes attached to the outputs and I have the scope set up for the XY mode so we could look at the difference in phase between the left and right channels. Right now I've got an 800 hertz signal going into the C9 and both channels and right now I'm going to turn on the sonic holography function and we'll see what that does to the phase. So you can see that we no longer have a straight 45 degree line. We've got a little bit of phase difference. I'm not sure exactly what it is, probably 10 degrees maybe. And that's at 800 hertz. I'm gonna go ahead and change that again because we do have a few points. We have four kilohertz. So let me go ahead and set the generator to four kilohertz and see what the phase looks like there. So at four kilohertz, we have still a little bit of phase, not a lot. It's, I don't know, five or 10 degrees maybe. And I'm gonna go ahead and move it to eight kilohertz. That's another test point. And at eight kilohertz, we see we have more of a phase shift and the amplitude changed. And that's because we saw that the frequency response definitely was not flat for the C9. 
And now I have another test point at 14 kilohertz. Now I just have test points. I actually don't have how much they would change in phase. So at 14 kilohertz, you can see that the uh, amplitude changed, but the phase kind of stayed about the same. I would say that's less than 10 degrees of phase shift between the left and right channels. And this is with the aperture at narrow and injection ratio at normal. I'm going to go ahead and change the injection ratio to wide and we'll see what happens to the phase change here at 14 kilohertz. And I should point out that I've got two volts RMS uh, going into the C9. Okay, you can see with the wide aperture, the phase change shifted. It's not as much. So now I'm going to change the injection ratio to theoretical. And you can see there was very little change, uh, at least at 14 kilohertz when I went to theoretical. Let me go down to 800 hertz and see how things are affected there. So at 800 hertz, it looks like the amplitude changed, but the phase kind of stayed about the same there with the theoretical injection. And that is the normal injection mode at 800 hertz. And it changed a little bit in phase, not very much. The amplitude changed just a tad. And I'm going to switch over to the wide mode. And the phase didn't really change a lot. It changed the amplitude a little bit. So that kind of just demonstrates a little bit about some of the phase change that is going on with the C9 at a few different frequency points. As you saw in the test data, at least the few things that I measured were within the specifications are pretty darn close to these specifications from, you know, 1983, let's say. And, you know, it has an odd frequency response. It does alter things. It's kind of the way this thing works. I'm not a purist as far as I got to have the flattest room and the, uh, you know, the flattest loudspeakers. It's why they have equalizers and other things that you can put in the system or in your room to make it sound the way that you like it. And I do like the sonic holography effect. The folks that I have had over that have heard it have been impressed. And, you know, you can always switch it out if you don't like it. But I thought before I mounted into my system and got to undo cables and power cords and all that and, and fit it in there, I would go ahead and uh, do this review. At some point, maybe I'll add a remote control to switch the sonic holography in and out, but I'm not sure that's going to be a real uh, pressing thing to do at this point. Now, it does affect the frequency responses you saw. Um, for those of you that really like flat frequency responses and everything, I probably would not put this in, or maybe you could switch it out, just have it on a special occasion switched in. But overall, it's, it just kind of adds a different experience to the music. I like having different experiences in my music other than just the music itself, but uh, I like it to sound, you know, as good as uh, I can to me. And that's kind of what this hobby is about is, you know, having stuff sound good to you. So once again, if you like this video, please hit the like button. As you know, um, from what I've seen, there, there's a lot of Bob Carver fans, so I hope if you're just checking out the videos and you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to the channel because it just helps it grow. So when I have a reunion, which I'm going to have coming up in a few years, and I can say, oh, I've got a YouTube channel. That's what I'm doing in retirement. And it's just not friends and family. So once again, please subscribe if you have not. Of course, please don't forget to comment as those are interesting and enjoyable for me to read most of the time, even if you disagree with me. So until next time, have a great day or night.